So it does mean a little bit of education about our bodies and, you know, this new organ that's suddenly come into our lives, which we didn't know 10 years ago really was there, uh, that all of us have. And all of us just need to know more about that organ so we, we know how to feed it right. And if we do that, then everything else just slots into place. With the current situation of the world, we have all this technology, science, and we have this great understanding of, you know, human evolution in our history, yet we can't agree upon the optimal diet for our species. Why is this? I guess because we're looking for a simple solution. And humans love simple solutions, like they love meals in a pill or, you know, black and white advice. And it's, humans are complex and food is even more complex. And I think this is why uh, we're struggling to fit all this amazing difference between people into one box. And so it's, uh, it's quite normal that we see the huge diversity of uh, diets all around the world and people have survived on these for millions of years. And we're trying to sort of compress it into our modern view of there is one diet that fits all. And it, it turns out that's actually not true. And uh, we're much more flexible and adaptable than I think people uh, give humans credit for. An inconvenient truth, because it would be easy if we could all just eat a certain diet and move on from the food thing and just go on living our lives. But given the situation, somebody who doesn't have, you know, we're in unique positions where we have a lot of time to research and dig at different options and to experiment but for the person out there who's busy, they have a family, they have, you know, a job and they can't really dig into the research. But we're definitely in a crisis right now with our health. You know, chronic diseases are skyrocketing and and we have a major problem. And a lot of people want to make this shift, but they're confused. How do they go about starting to get that inertia and head in the right direction? Well, I think it's about thinking it not as an obesity crisis, but actually a food crisis that... We've lost touch with uh, what real food is and what food is good for us and what's bad for us, how to evaluate food. We've, we've lost touch with that. And so it's about re-educating people. And what I, I like to do in, you know, in my, my books and, and uh, talks is really to start thinking of food differently. It's not about fuel. It's not about calories. It's not about fats versus sugars and people should start thinking about it is what is the best food to put in your body to help your gut microbes and if you make that shift in thinking you know you, you're not going to go far wrong if you can uh, understand what your gut microbes like to eat uh, to keep you them healthy and you healthy then actually you've got a pretty good blueprint for uh, all kinds of different diets wherever you are in the world. And I think that's where I'm moving to, you know, if you just wanted to get a very simple message out there, it's don't eat as, you know, governments tell you to eat or manufacturers or labels on supermarket or advertising. Uh, don't go for quirky diets that restrict what you eat. Go for what microbes uh, want you to eat. And, uh, in order to be healthy. And I think if you do that, then the, you know, the rest comes much more easily. So it does mean a little bit of education about our bodies and, you know, this new organ that's suddenly come into our lives, which we didn't know 10 years ago really was there, uh, that all of us have. And all of us just need to know more about that organ. So we, we know how to feed it right. And if we do that, then everything else just slots into place. Feeding our gut microbiome, probably not the answer most people were expecting, but one I wholeheartedly agree with. And I want to get into the nitty gritty here. Again, this is going to be big for a lot of people who don't have the time to get into all the nuances, but let's start with this. Let's pick this apart. So somebody that wants to start eating for the gut microbiome, how do they begin? I have four basic rules for people which they can remember as a way to help their gut microbes and as a general food, food rule. The first is to try and eat 30 different types of plant every week. And remember that plants are not just kale, they are nuts, seeds, 
herbs, spices, and things you wouldn't normally think of as, as plants. And some people even think of coffee as a plant. So, uh, and some, you could also include red wine. Now, the second rule is to have regular fermented foods as a small amount every day, uh, like um, not only cheese and yogurt, which everyone knows about, but fermented milk, kefir, kombuchas, fermented tea. And then, of course, you've got sauerkrauts or Korean kimchi, which are uh, fermented vegetables. Then the third thing I, I tell people is to try and pick these plants that are high in polyphenols. And these are the defensive chemicals that all plants have to some extent, but they range really widely uh, between them. So the ones with the high polyphenol counts are really good for your gut microbes. And they're the colorful ones, the ones that have strong, uh, often slightly bitter tastes. And you find them in uh, nuts, you find them in seeds, you find them in berries, you find them in high quality uh, olive oil, you find them in coffee beans, uh, you find them in green tea. Um, and it's, it's the, the plant that has the red bits, the, the really big colors. It's more like the purple carrots compared to the, the light orange ones. Uh, they're, they're the three positive rules. And the, and the, the fourth rule is to try and, uh, help your gut microbes out by not having too many ultra processed foods, which comes with a whole range of chemicals, which, uh, they find hard to deal with. And also, ultra-processes generally deprives them of nutrition and, and fiber. And if you follow those basic rules, uh, you can't go far wrong. Let's go a bit deeper into some of the nuances here. Going back to the polyphenol piece. So you mentioned eating foods high in polyphenols to feed the gut microbiome. Let's take that story a little bit further. So we're eating these foods. The gut microbiome is going to get these polyphenols. What happens next? Well, the... The gut microbes break down the plants that you're eating and the, particularly the fibers. And this releases these polyphenols as well as other nutrients in the fiber. And it acts as like rocket fuel for the gut microbes, which allows them to uh, reproduce and also produce their own powerful chemicals, which are medicinal chemicals or, or nutrients, which are key for our body. So those chemicals get passed once they've, they've got the polyphenols, they've got the fiber, they're then passed to the immune cells lining the gut and other receptors around the body and transmitted through the bloodstream, through our nervous system, all kinds of pathways we're only just beginning to discover to keep our body in its perfect metabolic state. They will send signals to the brain to stop us uh, overeating. They will uh, send signals make to prevent depression uh, through chemicals like serotonin. Uh, but their main influence is this interaction with our immune system, which most of it is actually in our gut, just where our microbes are, and that's not by chance. So the two, the immune system and the gut microbes, are constantly talking to each other through these little chemical signals and sort of feeding off each other. And that is really important for our body because that, starts to affect our long-term health, how we react to everything from COVID to uh, autoimmune disease, to food allergies, but also as a preventive measure against cancers, against aging. And there's an increasing knowledge that this is really important. So you know, the more polyphenols, the more um, variety of these chemicals that you're, you're feeding your microbes, the, the more species you can propagate and the more uh, healthy chemicals they're producing, really to keep you in balance. So that's that's why we think polyphenols are important. And they also, there's a group of them that actually have been shown to reduce inflammation as well. So they reduce the stress on the body generally, uh, and particularly our blood vessels. And that's why they used to be called, before we knew about the gut microbiome, they used to be all be called antioxidants, which was a very vague general medical term about how they could mop up the uh, sort of side effects of, of general metabolism, which otherwise would build up and cause uh, stress to the body. But now we know much more about, we know that the humans themselves, we can't process the polyphenols without the microbiome. And they pr do produce considerable energy for the microbes. So it's, it's their sort of special 
superfood, if you like. And I would assume the second step of building up that gut microbiome would be integral to happen before the polyphenols. Not that you're going to wait to eat polyphenols, but because the, the gut microbiome is going to eat the polyphenols and create all these health benefits, if we don't have a good microbiome to start with, I'm assuming we're not going to get the same results. I think to some extent that's true, uh, but uh, we, we don't really know this interaction between uh, the different states of the microbiome and how they uh, can process foods. But we do know in general that if you lack certain microbes, you can't fully get all the nutrients from the plants or the foods as well. So we do know the dangers of people who go long periods of time on very unhealthy diets, uh, low in fiber, can sort of wipe out a lot of their good microbes and it, it can be hard to get them back into your into your gut uh, through just introducing a, a few specific foods. It takes much longer, we think, to reintroduce good microbes than it does to um, uh, suppress bad ones, uh, suppress the inflammatory ones that we see with people on regular junk food diets. So uh, this is a very new science. Um, there's anecdotal stories, um, uh, which I, I wrote about in the books, is my... my um, I was wanted to do the study of eating 10 days at McDonald's to see what effect it would have on my gut microbes. And um, many people probably know this story, but it turned out that the, the volunteer who came forward to do the study instead of me was my son, who uh, was really keen on McDonald's and, and, and desperate for cash as well, for free food for 10 days as a student. So uh, he did this. But um, despite wanting to quit at four days, which I told him he couldn't do, um, because I, I wasn't a responsible father, he, he carried on for 10 days, but he lost, uh, according to this, this N of 1 study, 40% of his gut diversity in that time. And in the subsequent years, I've tried to feed him up, uh, but he's never got back to that um, original starting level. And so peer, people who do have prolonged periods with, with no fiber at all, with very poor diets, um, I th we think may struggle a little bit to do this. But uh, that's obviously an extreme case, and it's just a N of 1. And I, ha I think we can change most people's gut microbes for the better. And we know the story from uh, this the similar story about um, the ability to digest seaweed. So naturally, people in, in the US and Canada, the UK are not, uh, don't have those microbes that can break down seaweed and get the nutrients from them. But if uh, they live sometime in Japan or uh, maybe, you know, in Vancouver with lots of sushi restaurants um, or San Francisco, they would pick up the microbes from the food and uh, eventually they would then uh, have the capacity to break down seaweed. So I think you can train your, your gut to do this, but it does take a bit longer than people think. It's not a sort of immediate that any microbe, you know, can suddenly uh, retrain itself to eat a different uh, product. You talked about there picking up different microbes from different foods. Is that where the first step you talked about eating a diversity of foods, is that how that fits in? So you're eating different foods and they're going to have different populations of microbiomes on them that are going to repopulate the gut? Not really. I think it's more, um, I mean, yes, there's something about eating uh, uh, these foods that have microbes, but most of those uh, microbes on the plant, say if you don't fully wash it or you know, just in the soil, aren't, aren't ones that generally live within your gut. And so uh, you have to try and cultivate. You hope that there is a few seeds lying around somewhere in your gut, just dormant because they they go dormant with these spores for a long time. And so what you hope is that if you eat this diversity of, of plants, uh, each plant has hundreds of different chemicals in it. And it may be that this microbe only likes four or five of those chemicals, but it can be just be titillated by these chemicals as they, as they uh, sense them. And it'll come out of its dormant state and start reproducing and, and get a niche that builds it up to... Uh, it's uh, you know it's sort of full capacity, and I think that's really what we're we're hoping for that 
because humans never run out of microbes, whatever you do to them, you know, and we know this from people that have uh, barium enemas or they go through these cleansing processes. Uh, you can never get rid of uh, your micro species and they don't tend to change that much. So uh, we think really there's going down to very small levels and it's how you sort of coax them back up again uh, so that they can actually be visible, uh, we think is, is what's happening. But, you know, again, some of this is guesswork uh, because it, it, it is so new. Um, so I want to stress that it hasn't all been studied, you know, uh, in infinite detail. We're just trying to work work all this through. But certainly it's the idea of good bugs versus bad bugs is, is something that we're um, coming to as well as this concept of, of diversity and both the number of species you've got and the ratio of the good guys to the bad guys, I think, is... is becoming the the way we're looking at gut health in general but the 30 plants a week gives you sufficient variety of chemicals to keep uh, all your my, your microbes happy and reproducing and producing their good stuff for you i think that's the that's the basic principle Whereas if you're only eating two or you know if potato chips you're only a vegetable then you've only got uh, a few microbes that can really survive off that the others are living off fat and um, you know a bit of the meat, and uh, you know st- so the rest are struggling to survive. Well, let's come back to the story, of your son. You mentioned it being such an extreme thing, and unfortunately, in today's day, for a lot of people, that might not be so extreme. I mean, having it every day for ten days, I'm sure that's a little bit far for most, hopefully. But what I'm really curious about is because this is, you know people are eating a lot of processed food like that. And, and there's so many different areas. And I want to dig into this in a little bit that are the fourth pillar you talked about things that are actually killing the microbiome. But we know antibiotics have been heavily prescribed in in more recent years and had an effect on people's microbiomes. So what I'm getting at here is what did you do to help your son rebuild that diversity? You mentioned it came down 40% because I think this can be really helpful for people if they've been eating junk food or if they've been on antibiotics and they feel like they're not in a good position right now and they almost feel like they're at ground zero, how did you help your son rebuild that? Well, it's it's the same principles really for everybody. Um, and we know that generally uh, people with very poor gut microbes, my, you know, poor gut health do the best when they are transferred onto a good diet as opposed to improving someone who's already pretty high. So you can reduce the inflammation pretty quickly by just giving a variety of sides. So I used to send him, you know, um, boxes of fruit and vegetables and, uh, you know, he played on my guilt all the time when he was, he said, I haven't got money for vegetables, dad, can you send me some more money? So that always worked. Um, I got him uh, eating regular yogurt, full fat yogurts, and I tried to dissuade him from having junk food, you know, more than uh, once or twice a week, uh, which was very different because he, he was a student at the time when they had uh, terrible diets and they on very, very um, little, small budgets. And really that, that's, that's how, and, and also got him uh, to eat less meat because uh, he was eating generally poor quality meat because he couldn't afford the good stuff. And in general, um, meat per se is not particularly bad for your gut microbes unless it's highly processed, but even good quality meat stops you putting extra plants on your plate. So that was a, a real consideration to say, listen, you know, start having some meat-free meals, start having less meat on the plate, extra extra plants all the time. So that's what I've been sort of nagging his, his message. Um, and, you know, and I've, I've, I got him to um, do a personalized nutrition test. Uh, uh, he's uh, just done it um, with Zoe, um, the company I, I co-founded, to also understand, you know, his ratio of how much fats to, to sugars he should be eating. Uh, and with his microbiome tests, uh, we, we will be giving him uh, more precise advice about which uh, foods he can eat to boost particular microbes that we know are healthy and which 
um, foods would suppress the bad ones as well. So I think we're slowly getting there, but uh, I think I was just illustrating it. It, uh, it. it can be tough. And as you said, there are, you know, uh, probably, you know, tens of millions of uh, people in the Western world who have nearly all the time this ultra processed diet. And it is an absolute crisis. And that's why I said it's a, a food crisis rather than obesity crisis, uh, because you know, it is literally killing uh, the microbes and it is making uh, obesity sort of, and diabetes uh, inevitable. When I asked you about rebuilding in, in the protocol, I noticed you didn't get into probiotics or prebiotics. And these are products that have hit the market hard. And, and I know from your book, you're not a fan in general, at least of supplements. So talk about, it, it's pretty evident by your answer, but talk more about that. Is Are those ever products that you recommend to people or use yourself? I've, I've used them a few times myself. Um, um, particularly when I had, you know, I, I take many less antibiotics than I used to 10 years ago before I understood the gut microbiome, but, um, I've been forced to, a couple of times in the last 10 years to take a course of antibiotics, uh, for chest infections and things. And then I've taken a combination of, uh, natural probiotics, which I always prefer, which is my go-to kimchi, uh, kefirs and kombuchas for three Ks, uh, and have tried uh, people's suggestions of sort of pr proprietary uh, probiotics in that time. But when I looked at the literature, I haven't been convinced that uh, for people who aren't unwell, probiotics make much of a difference. And that's probably because we're all incredibly different in our um, our gut microbes, very individual. And we, when you pick a commercial probiotic, there's just a handful of uh, species that are used in this field that have been approved and everything and have an official patent, to, and et cetera. So the chances that those particular microbes will fit into uh, my community or your community or anyone's is actually rather small and have a, a major impact. We know that they do uh, affect the metabolism uh, to some extent, but and they do work in people with severe disease, for example, you know, people with uh, gut problems, infections, young kids, elderly, elderly people, they are useful. But the, my view of reviewing all the evidence is that uh, there's very little evidence they help normal people prevent uh, illnesses. And I'd much rather people took probiotics in natural food because a you know they're alive because you can smell them and so you know it's not some fake ripoff uh, stuff that's been hanging around in a warehouse for three years um, or and also you get a greater variety generally of species when you pick uh, probiotics in real food so I think they're 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 the, the reasons that I, I'm generally uh, not in favour of probiotic. I don't tend to believe it, uh, with with some exceptions. And there are some, you know, some studies of people with uh, depression or irritable bowel syndrome where the evidence is better. Um, but for normal people, just saying I want this, I want to take a regular probiotic for my general health. I think until they're personalised, um, I don't think they're going to be very useful unless people experiment with, you know, multiple different ones. Uh, and do test themselves. But I think it's more like the age of personalization. I think we are going to move in the next five years to better probiotics that are reflecting the new science. And there are a few that I think we're going to see in the next year, if we'll tell you, that have come out of the latest uh, science rather than a hundred year old science that we've known about, you know, these ones in yogurt or, or these fermented foods, ones that do affect our physiology. And so I, I, I'm, I'm not saying uh, never, I'm just saying at the moment, for most people, I, I don't recommend them. But I think things are moving very fast. So I hope I'll be able to change my mind soon. And we've got some interesting data that we're collecting um, as part of the Zoe projects. Now we've got 30,000 people's diet and microbiome results that we can start to link up some of these exciting microbes that are affected by diet and uh, and health. And 
But it takes a long time to go from that discovery to putting um, this into a, a commercial product. And so there's perhaps about a five-year delay between the science and actually uh, delivering these things, which is always a bit frustrating for people like me who are rather impatient. We've spent a lot of time now digging into how to build up the gut microbiome, but let's hone in on the details of pillar number four and talk about some of the biggest players when it comes to things that are having a negative impact on the microbiome, things we want to avoid. Things you want to avoid. So uh, I'm calling ultra-processed food one item, but obviously it is multiple uh, foods and it is hard to define. Uh, some definitions include any food that contains more than 10 ingredients that you don't recognize, which I think is a nice one. Others are uh, foods that are only prepared from extracts of other foods. So they're not a combination of real foods together, but they are uh, the extract of some grain, the extract of some bean, the extract of some protein, and they're sort of put together, molded together in a factory and presented to us. Now, the average American has 60% of their energy from these kinds of foods. So they're and 50% in Canada and the US and UK. So they're pretty ubiquitous. And we believe they're bad for the gut microbes for firstly the reason they often have very little fiber. So most of it doesn't reach the uh, actual uh, lower intestine that's of, of any value anyway. Most of it is a, a lot of it is absorbed early on. And the bits that do reach the, the lower intestine might include some of these chemicals. Um, the first thing one to think about is the emulsifiers. These are the uh, food glues that do occur in nature, but also uh, are chemically made that stick foods together. So particularly in the food processing service serve, uh, arena, you've got lots of these things made in factories that wouldn't naturally go together. So you've got to stick something there to make it uh, get some consistency and, and stop it just fragmenting. And so we know that at least three out of the five commonest uh, emulsifiers used have a negative effect on our gut microbes and uh, cause the, a loss of general diversity and alter the uh, chemical signals that they are producing. So they send off... Um, negative inflammatory signals to the body and the brain when when they hit. There are some ones that may be fine. We also know that there's actually quite a lot of individual variations. So some people might be super sensitive to these in their, their gut microbes and others might be able to have many more of them. So again, I think we're going to see a, a personalization about which of these very commonly used products in, in our food system are causing some people real problems you know, a bit like we used to worry about uh, e-number, you know, additives and all these other things that uh, we really need to pay much more attention to how these chemicals affect our gut microbes. And just the record, they're never studied in any country before they're uh, widely available to hundreds of millions of people. And it's crazy that you know they're not they're only tested, you know, for cancer in rats, never for um, its effect on, on our our precious microbes. So that's one one group. The other one that uh, I'm particularly worried about is the artificial sweeteners. And many people have artificial sweetener, uh, uh, artificial sweetened beverages, you know, the diet Pepsi's, diet Cokes that are told are perfectly healthy for us. And they are good in, if to reduce uh, tooth problems, tooth decay, undoubtedly, uh, that's a big bonus. But Metabolically, the trials are really unconvincing that you switch from one from a full sugar uh, drink to the diet equivalent. It uh, has any real difference on your metabolism or your weight. And that's rather odd given they're so calorie rich. So we think there are other products in there. And so there's been several studies on aspartame and sucralose, which are the two most commonly used uh, sweeteners, showing that uh, in uh, first, in mouse studies, they can cause uh, damage to mouse guts, and that those transfers can be uh, transferred from one animal to another. And they've also done a small, limited number of human studies, also showing that uh, in some people, not all, uh, they can disrupt the human microbiota as well. 
Again, the idea that the microbes encounter some chemical that, remember, most of these come from the uh, petrol industry, paraffins, etc., uh, they wouldn't normally be eating. So they're not really adapted for that. They hit the um, spartane molecule and sort of sparks fly and weird chemicals come off. We, we think that's what's happening. It can't really process it and uh, it seems to upset them. Uh, and we don't know about the new ones like stevia really, um, but I think in general we should be wary about it and realize that there might be lots of differences between humans and how we react to them. And the, the final group are I think, preservatives uh, that are there to make give food its really long shelf life. And generally, they tend to be antimicrobial. And so that's uh, a reason to really uh, worry and fear about them. We don't have that much knowledge about them. So it's that lack of good nutrients, the lack of uh, fiber, as we've mentioned, the polyphenols and the plants, the virtually non-existent in these foods. So there's nothing really good in there. And you've got these increasing sets of weird chemicals that uh, in many of us do have uh, side effects. So it's taken me a while to answer that, but that, that's my, uh, uh, my worry. And I think it, it, but it's important because I think it's, it's, it, no one ever focuses on, they're all focused on, oh, is it lower in calories? Is it lower in fat or sugar or salt? And all the evidence now is showing that it's, that's not the main reason. It's, it's these these factors that affect our gut microbes, but the other thing is, as been shown in um, this NIH trial, is they also make you hungrier. And some of that might be the microbes sending off hunger signals, or it might be a direct effect on the brain. And uh, that's one reason that you know I think it's it's the number one enemy. Although you know, and we know we're all susceptible because they're they're made to be super tasty. Um, so I'd like, and we can't do without them completely. So I think, you know, we, we have to be realistic and, and work out how we can reformulate them or have such a good basic diet that we can occasionally, uh, go crazy and have one of these, uh, super tasty, but unhealthy meals without it having long-term consequences. So you've went really in depth on the processed foods, but what about, additives within whole foods, things like antibiotics and meats they put in the feed or pesticides on conventional produce, how do those impact the microbiome? We know that in theory, they, they impact them. And there are lots of uh, mouse and rodent studies showing the effects of uh, both um, antibiotics and pesticides on rodents. There's really limited data on humans because it's very hard to study humans long term uh, for those for those effects and if we take antibiotics we know that some there's again a hugely varied varied response of humans to a standard dose of antibiotics some people microbiome recovers after a you know a therapeutic dose very quickly but maybe one in three people will still not have recovered six months later so it's those people who worry about that if they're getting these tiny doses from uh, anti you know, cheap meats with uh, antibiotics in them, they could have a long-term effect. And if you extrapolate those to the animal models, that causes uh, obesity and increased allergy. So I think an important message is that antibiotics, whether you take them by, by mouth, injection, or in a slow amount in your food, have the potential to do you harm. Now, I don't think we know how much harm, and it could be extremely variable between us, so hard to say what the average is. But I, I do think um, we should be much more wary about uh, antibiotics in our food system, not just because of antibiotic resistance, but because uh, it, if people are, it's a bit, you know, subjected to these things nearly every day of their lives, it's quite likely to have an effect that is very hard to see in a human experiment. So certainly it's another reason to move away from cheap uh, uh, processed meats in food and, and look for a, a equivalents, either going to high quality meats that you know are free of these products or using meat uh, substitutes. Now, uh, pesticides is another one, and most of the data is on um, Roundup, uh, which is... Uh, the most commonly used um, 
pesticide in the world, which is actually a herbicide. So it's uh, we use the terms interchangeably, but really the idea is it, it uh, kills off weeds. And it's healthy for humans, but interestingly, uh, it does alter our gut microbes and means that they then produce abnormal chemicals in the same process and so can affect our immune systems and our health. And the, the studies are suggesting that, you know, it is sometimes associated with some strange blood cancers and several juries have awarded big amounts of money in California uh, for it. But it, it, I think my idea is it's likely a very small effect and people who should be worried are more like uh, young babies and pregnant women. Uh, I don't think it has major effects on most of us, but certainly we should be looking for alternatives if they're sustainable and, and don't uh, completely mess up our food system. So um, the data is accumulating that they can definitely affect our gut microbes. And I think this individuality is going to be, but there will be some people that will react to it. Maybe those people are the unlucky ones that might get these um, these rare lymphomas. Um, so another reason that we should be switching, as many countries are, to uh, getting organic foods and moving away from some of the foods that just naturally, like oats, contain huge amounts of, of pesticides just because they, um, the way that they're cultivated. And Tim, where along your health journey did you become fascinated with the microbiome? And I'm curious, what was the catalyst for that? It started about, uh, I guess, about 13 years ago when uh, I, I've been studying twins for 30 years. So my day job, if you like, is, is looking after the UK's biggest twin registry of uh, 15,000 twins that I've been studying for 30 years. And I was always interested in why twins were so similar, you know, got the same habits, the same smile, picking up a beer the same way. And and finding genes for all kinds of things, which I did for about 15 years. But then at that point, I started looking and saying, why are identical twins often so different? One gets cancer, the other one doesn't. One gets rheumatoid arthritis, the other one doesn't. One is happy or depressed, one's thin, one's you know, overweight. And uh, these are you know genetic clones. They've lived the same life for 18 years. It's like, you know, they shouldn't be different. If you can find why they're different, then you can crack all kinds of medical mysteries. So I first look at something called epigenetics, which is how you can switch genes on and off, and really got into that, but realized that those effects were really quite small. They existed, so in theory it was right, but they just didn't explain these really massive differences. And at that point, I, I went uh, in a, a genetics conference, heard a, a talk about the microbiome uh, from a guy called Marty Blazer, who was looking at uh, ulcers. And it was this whole idea of eradicating duodenal ulcers, which are caused by this bug. And uh, it was uh, an interesting talk because he said, once you eradicate these, uh, the bug that's causing the ulcers, you actually get other problems. You actually get other cancers and it causes other problems further down the line because of this intensive uh, antibiotic treatment and that we should be wary about, you know, just killing all the bugs. And that's when really I got, oh, this is interesting, this microbiome. So then I got together with some, uh, with Laird Cornell and we did the first big twin study of the microbiome to see, uh, what, how much help did genes really influence the microbes or not? And it turned out that just as I suspected, identical twins actually had rather very different microbes. And so that was the aha moment for me. He said, okay, really different. Not just epigenetics was a little bit different, but these were so different. They were hardly different, any, any more similar than you or I. And, uh, that just was said, that's great. So, it, and that was great for two reasons. It could explain all these differences in how we respond to foods and our health, all these mysteries about why one, why one person gets a disease, the other one doesn't. And I, whole relationship with food suddenly came into to play and i think um it also had a really good unlike genetics which i had been doing for 20 years i think it had a really good feel because it was motivational because you can change your gut microbes you can't 
change your parents. Um, and I think that was really important, empowering for everyone that we can all eat healthily, uh, improve our gut microbes, change our lifestyles. We can do this and therefore influence our own health without needing, you know, surgical intervention or medicines. When it comes to these twins and they're identical and their microbiome is so different, I'm curious why that is. I mean, I can see if one of them picked up and moved to the other side of the world and was in a different environment eating different foods. But for the ones that, you know, were living in the same area and living a similar lifestyle, why the difference? Yeah, it's it's weird. I mean, you know, that and it just I think it what it shows is that the the early life, our first four years of life, are possibly most important and we sort of forget about it. But in those first four years, obviously, we start life with zero microbes and essentially sterile. And the birth process, we get them from the messiness of the birth canal and uh, what's going on there, all the blood and poo and everything, and all the secretions. And it's very random what happens and falls into the baby's mouth. And even with twins, you know, if a different nurse picked them up, those microbes would go from that nurse, the skin, into in onto the baby. Uh, the, which baby had an infection first, uh, which was typically uh, breastfeeding before the other or longer, would have an effect. And all kinds of illnesses have big effects on, on these, these growing infants. So that's how they seem to be developing a different microbes. It's, it's a lot rand, a lot of randomness, which must be there for a reason to give us uh, evolutionary reason that it's evolved. It wasn't so strict. Obviously, every baby gets microbes so they can digest breast milk, but all the extra ones um, are really not very programmed and seem to be rather random. And I think that that's really fascinating to me. But it may be that we're more different now because we're exposed to things like antibiotics as children much more than ever before. Uh, but even just common viruses have massive effects and uh, on, on, on kids, you know, having different friends at school, they'll be swapping microbes, going to a friend's house and, you know, licking the dog, uh, all of these things, playing in the garden. We don't know. But yeah, we're, we're much more different than we would imagine. In your book, you talk about going to Africa and visiting the Hadza tribe. And I'm curious, when you went to do that, were you looking at the microbiome of those people at all? We were. So we're working with a group of us. Um, we're working on the gut microbiome um, and produced some papers on this because they've been studied before I got there. And we knew uh, from some of the, the work uh, there that they had this very rich uh, microbiome. And we also did some, uh, they have twice as many microbes as we do and very different profiles. So it looks like we've lost the ones that they still have. And it was very interesting to look at the differences between uh, you know, Western societies and, and those ones. And generally, you know, they just had super healthy uh, gut microbes that we were all very jealous of. And... We also did some other testing there, looking at their biological ages and uh, showed generally that they they were, they didn't often know their ages, but when we were guessing what their ages were, their biological age was, was really doing pretty well. And we found that there's a pretty good correlation between biological age and uh, your microbiome. So it was, um, uh, we did all, all we, did, we were doing those tests and I, I was actually testing my own microbes uh, as I was living with them for several days, eating their food, you know, going off walking, hunting with them, uh, and with no uh, five-star showers at the end of the day, um, you know, it was uh, interesting. I, I and I did manage to increase my microbial diversity by about thirty um, percent in that short while I was there. But it was short-lived. As soon as I got back on the plane and at that airplane food, I think it it. Uh, it regressed back by the time I got to London. But it was a, yeah, an interesting journey to see how, uh, with their variety and their lifestyle, um, you know, maybe not just the food they're eating, but also surrounded by the dirt and the, uh, the animals, and being in the open air all the time in a non-sterile environment uh, was obviously very helpful to uh, 
our ancestors. Talk more about what a typical day would look like. What time would you get up and take us through what a day looked like? Well, it's equatorial Africa. So it um, was, you know, it's sort of 6.30 in the morning till 6.30 nights, you know, um, dawn and dusk. And you uh, uh, generally slept in a little bit until it got too hot. Uh, so you get up about 7.30 and um, walk around and chat. And uh, interesting, that there was um, none, none of the, the hads that were interested in the concept of breakfast. They would just uh, maybe get out of the river or something and, and, and splash their faces and get ready and, and, and start very, very slowly work, working up. And we asked them, you know, I said, you know, where's breakfast? They didn't have a word for breakfast. So it was, so we want breakfast, well, just, you know, grab some berries. Um, and at about 10 or 11, they, they, they women did actually get uh, some baobabs um, which were lying all over the place and uh, crunched them into a porridge, which was like a, a delicious uh, drink full of full of fiber. So they tended to have that about eleven o'clock, and um, then you know they women women and men would separate, go their very different lives. Uh, men do. We were at a time when it was the. Um, uh, it was the the dry season, so actually um, uh, it was quite easy to get game because they all went to the same waterhole, and you know it was very easy to, to kill the game. So they didn't have a problem with with meat at that time. There was plenty of it, and so they were all feeling very comfortable. And the women would collect um, uh, tubers, so they'd just go out, tap a bit on the ground. And uh, with a with a pointy stick, just dig up these amazing tubers, a bit like sweet potatoes or yams, and then spend the next three hours chatting with their kids, roasting these things uh, on the fire. And some of the men would go out and pick berries uh, off trees, just they wanted to walk, um, and they were really abundant. And these are really tiny little berries, very quite. Um, sour without the sweetness but they had a great flavor to them and big variety you come up with five different types in your hand and you know just it's like a giant supermarket this place and and you'd find these kids coming back with little birds and things that they'd, they'd kill with bows and arrows uh it was um i was shocked how easy it was to get food i mean i think that's the uh the, the one thing that surprised me totally i thought oh my god i'm going to be you know doing 20 kilowatt kilo kilometer uh fast walks every day just to get you know one tiny squirrel or something and would be ecstatic but no it was um uh it was easier and they're, and they're also into their honey and so when someone finds honey the whole tribe drop everything whatever they're doing even you know even hunting they're just about to get some big game they go and they uh, go to the tree where they found the honey and the whole the whole group of 50 people are there helping and sharing that that honey so it was um yes my impression was of sort of abundant food very relaxed idea no concept of uh, uh, breakfast ultimate sharing everything got shared out in a very sociable uh amenable way no one at first uh and so it was um that was very much this social bond was all around food and about the fire and the barbecue. Everything was barbecued. There was no, there's no, you know, no microwaves or, <laughs> or even uh, much of the kitchen utensils. It was you know, you had a knife, you skinned whatever it was, stuck it on the barbecue. You had it, you know, with uh, with the yams, and uh, that's what they liked to. And they sat around chatting for for hours. Then they'd go to um, when it was dark. Uh, wait till the embers of the fire went out and you know generally they rolled up a blanket and either slept by the fire or in, in small in small huts and uh, they slept really well for uh, seven and a half hours and uh, you know they had a pretty good life and that's that's the life of our ancestors really um, and not a 
uh, not an overweight one amongst them, and they all look pretty fit because by the time they've got there, you know, a lot of the kids, it's the kids who die off, but if they make it to adulthood, they're, they're super fit and healthy and, you know, they live without diabetes, cancer, allergies, autoimmune diseases, all this kind of stuff. So uh, it was, yeah, very privileged to have seen that. That must have been such a life-changing experience. How long ago was that, Tim? Uh, it was about um, five five years ago, I think. Uh, it, it, no, it was uh, quite remarkable. And I, I remember going with a very seasoned BBC journalist, Dan Saladino, and, he, he, and for him it was, yeah, very much a, a life-changing moment. He, and he'd been around the world, you know, covering uh, food stories. But, um, you know, it's like you're just watching your past. You know, you, you, it's like having a, a time machine in a way. And are they pretty welcoming to Westerners coming over and visiting? They are. I mean, they're quite shy, um, but they're used to uh, researchers doing this. They don't really understand it, but, you know, as long as they're trading something, um, they're super friendly and they're not they're not aggressive. So they know that the, the foreigners are sort of keeping their land safe for them uh, against the pastoralists who just want to cut down all the trees and... Um, uh, graze their cattle. So, um, yeah, they were, they were really cool. I mean, you know, but there's only a few thousand left. He talked about a natural part of their lifestyle was not eating breakfast till, you know, just before noon. Are you somebody that embraces intermittent fasting or have you since that experience? Yeah. In, in the last five years, I have changed my views on this. Um, I mean, I've always been keen on experimenting myself and when, uh, what we call, what we used to call intermittent fasting, uh, which I think is a bit complicated. The term 5-2 is what um, I used to call it. Uh, so reducing your calories for five days out of seven and and then eating as much as you like the next day. That was, I think, the old old term of intermittent fasting. Now, I've given this, this breakfast idea and having studied the literature to show that uh, despite... Uh, most websites in government places uh, around the world saying it's dangerous to skip breakfast, which was the dogma when I was brought up and at medical school, um, realized that actually that the, the data doesn't support that anymore. There's no real danger in skipping breakfast. And there are likely some benefits metabolic and um, weight wise for some people, not everybody. So that it should be something people should try. But I've got more interested in the last five years about this restricted, uh, so time restricted eating, and which is extending the overnight fast, which is pretty much what the Hadza do. So they would uh, stop eating, I would say, by about uh, nine, nine, eight or nine o'clock. That have their last munch of uh, you know, cold meat for the barbecue, and they wouldn't be eating anything else or drinking until then, until about. Uh, 11 the next morning. So they'd be naturally having a 14 hour overnight fast, which um, the current science is now supporting as the sort of optimal practical uh, way of doing this that actually rests your gut microbes, improves your metabolic health, and uh, can lead to re reduced uh, sugar dips and potentially uh, help you control weight better. So just by controlling how you eat rather than what you eat. And that's, that's I think, um, where I think the science is going. And that's what I now practice. So uh, I'm not saying I'm fastidious about it, but when it's relatively easy, I uh, will either skip breakfast or delay it uh, until after 11 or, or midday. And I found I feel much better on that. And uh, I just feel more sharp and alert because I'm not someone who feels super hungry when they wake up. Uh, and I, But I do embrace the idea that we're all unique and that some people do. And they, some people prefer, you know, getting an early breakfast, early early lunch, early dinner, and then nothing to eat afterwards. I, I find that really hard. Um, but I think let's listen to our bodies more and listen less to dogma often driven by the food industry, telling us we must have our cornflakes and, uh, you know, our Frosties, and this is the healthy breakfast, and that your kids will 
suffer dreadful things at school if you don't do that. You know, a lot of kids know when to eat, and um, I think we're doing a lot of harm by by sort of forcing particularly these high carb foods on on people early in the morning. Talk more about that piece of giving the gut microbiome a rest, because this is a piece that when people are talking about intermittent fasting, they don't often get into, or at least not the nuances. So obviously we're not providing food for ourselves, our system. And you mentioned how that can be metabolically healthy, at least for some people. But let's talk about what happens to the gut microbiome in the short term, and then again in the longer term. So short term, what happens when you stop eating uh, is that you're, because you've got to realize that your, your, your microbiome is, is living at super speed. So, you know, they, you know, they're having sex and uh, reproducing and having families, you know, every hour, sometimes up to every half an hour. So um, they're responding very fast to the environment. And we stop eating and the microbes that would normally be munching on our, uh, our food or a sandwich or whatever, you know, they're not reproducing anymore. They're not doing anything. So the, the group that normally, uh, and so they're outcompeted during that time by other microbes that actually like the scraps. They, they like eating the bits of sugars stuck in our mucus lining of our gut that has grown over, the, over that day. And so they're like grazing on this grass in our intestines, which is uh, from our own body. So they're, they're carnivores, if you like, eating our own bo- bodies, but it's in a nice way. They've evolved with us to keep our gut lining nice and tidy. And there are particular microbes. And there's one well-known one called Acamantia. You know, you only see it sort of coming out in big numbers at night. And uh, it's, it's a good guy because by nibbling at our, our mucus layer, it stops it getting leaky. So that's the short-term benefit of this. And we know that if you stop that happening, then your mucus, your your gut layer becomes less efficient and all kinds of things, and it can get inflamed. Now, if you overdo it, and, if, and the studies have shown, particularly in mice, going for like a, a week of fasting, uh, you can they overeat right through to the to the good bit. So you've got to be a bit careful uh, that you don't do, overdo the fasting. And long term, what we believe is these changes, which are really fitting into our sort of, in a way, ancient circadian rhythms, are beneficial for producing the right chemical signals from the microbes back to our body. So the studies are now showing that people who do this properly. You know, this 12 to 16 hour fasting period uh, gives a better metabolic health, reduces our sugar peaks when we eat foods, our fat peaks, and uh, can also lead to some weight loss. So this is a really exciting research, which is suddenly linking up some of these ideas about how fasting was good for you with our microbes, but in a way that doesn't actually alter the food you're eating, like the old fashioned 5-2 intermittent fasting, but actually... Uh, you can eat normally, but just in a, in a different time frame that suits you, either very early in the day or very late in the day. Somebody tuning into this point saying, okay, I want to give my gut microbiome lots of plants, lots of diversity. Why not just forego meat altogether and take that to the extreme and go vegan? And I know you personally, Tim, went on a six weeks journey where you experimented with that and ended up testing and having a B12 deficiency. So for people out there, there are a lot of people in the health and wellness space these days that are adopting a vegetarian, vegan, plant-based diet. Let's talk about why going to that extreme, even when it comes to the microbiome, can be a bit much. Yeah, well, obviously, I mean, we have to realize there are billions of people on the planet who do have a a vegan diet and uh, they live without meat or fish and uh, are perfectly healthy. And I think um, what I what I discovered is that um, you know we treat food a bit like religion. So we, we want these strict rules to say we have to do this, we, have, we, we can't do that. And clearly for me, a vegan diet wasn't healthy because of the lack of B12 and even taking B12 tablets wasn't enough for some reason to get my levels up and this affected my blood pressure, etc. So uh, for me, just having uh, 
meet once a month uh, seems to keep keep it in check, which presumably our evolution, you know, was geared up to do. Now, um, I think the danger of people uh, saying, I'm going to go healthy, I'm going to go vegan, is that many, uh, there are very healthy vegans who eat lots of diverse plants and get their nutrients and really understand what they're doing very well. But there are equally a large increasing group of vegans who eat uh, lots of ultra processed foods, um, sort of lots of meat equivalents, which are very poor quality with lots of these ultra processed ingredients and chemicals we talked about, who um, might also forget about B12 and uh, their iron levels and things that they, they need to balance up. So I think uh, going all the way vegan is an easier choice than someone like me. Uh, you know, people find it strange. Oh, you know, eating meat or fish once or twice a month is a bit odd. Um, but I think increasingly we need to have a more flexible approach to this, which works if you understand the gut microbes. Because when we did this study um, uh, a while back, uh, we looked at gut diversity and diet. And as well as finding the 30 plants a week being the, the best point, we, uh, we found that people who ate uh, lots of plants were as healthy as people. Were, it didn't matter if they ate meat or not. So excluding meat from your diet doesn't make you healthier as long as you're eating lots of plants. So I think that's, uh, that's an important point to make, that it, it's the plant side of it rather than the meat itself, if it's good quality, that is that is the factor here. So uh, I think everyone's got to find what they're comfortable with. And of course, we've got, you know, the uh, humane aspect of, of this, the ethical aspect of, of animals. We've got the health aspect. And now we've also got the environmental aspect. And I think increasingly people are going to look at these three things together and decide for themselves what they want to do. But I hope more people do have this sort of flexitarian approach that is individualized to their own needs rather than having these religious groups, you know, the carnivore group, the vegan group, the, uh, the keto group. Uh, and, you know, we, we could have a, an, all, an all embracing nutritional church. When it comes to meat, it seems like there's one group within that that is head and shoulders above the rest, and that's fish, especially fish like salmon, the fatty fish with the omega 3s. You've dedicated a whole chapter in your book talking about how there's more to that story. So for people out there that are including fish on a regular basis, even up to a few times a week, thinking this is a great thing for them, let's share the other side of the story. Yeah, so the other side of the story is that the data isn't that positive that fish is really good for you. And that was a shock to me because I thought, well, everyone knows fish is good for you. You know, I've been, it's been drummed into me, you know, for all of my life and uh, as a doctor and uh, uh, just as a, uh, a kid and, and as a parent as well, teaching my children, you've got to have this. It's good for your brain. You're going to fail your exams if you don't have fish. And of course, my son hated fish. And so uh, it was always a struggle. But um, the studies show marginal I improvements in longevity or health or heart disease in fish eaters versus non-fish eaters. So we're talking about sort of five to eight percent improvements. So people expect it to be massively different. So that's within the margin of error. Uh, there's no evidence that eating fish is harmful for you uh, in normal quantities. But I think the evidence that we must eat it to be healthy really isn't there. Uh, anything like the evidence. It's been massively hyped. And there are other ways of getting your omega-3s through uh, a whole wide, wide range of plants and also um, uh, some high quality, you know, grass fed meats as well. And so the idea that we, we should all be eating two or three portions of fish uh, we, is, is, it, it doesn't hold up health wise, but also we're, we're going to kill off all the fish on the planet very soon if we followed that advice. And we've now uh, lost something like 60% of our uh, fish stocks in recent times and most of the fish we eat is farmed and to produce farm fish you produce masses of environmental damage and you have to kill off lots of other fish to feed those ones that then uh, look nice on our plate so I think we need to have a real new look at fish and I think yes let's get 
high quality fish on the menu, uh, but let's get the sustainable types. Let's stop uh, basically uh, treating this as a special, you know, you can't touch fish. It's a, suit, it's a wonderful food for the planet. It certainly isn't. And, you know, seeing the horrors that in, you know, in prawns and, and shrimps that come from uh, these massive factories, uh, aquaculture factories in Asia, uh, and exported around the world really is bad. So we need to know much more about fish uh, and stop treating it with such uh, reverence. But I still like fish in a restaurant. You know, you can't beat a good fish, but let's pay extra for something that's sustainable and uh, is really tasty and uh, hasn't been fed other live fish just to make it look nice. So you're not a fan of overdoing the fish, not a fan of supplements. So it's safe to assume you're not a fan of fish oil which is the biggest supplement people are buying. Talk about if there's any benefit whatsoever of taking that. For most people, there is no benefit. If you're on a really poor diet, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, supplements do help people on, on very poor diets. And there's some evidence from the, the biggest trials that if you've just had a heart attack and you have a poor diet, then omega-3 supplements can actually help you. But uh, for you know, 95% of the population, uh, they've shown in very large randomized trials that there's no difference to placebo. So if there is an effect, it is pretty tiny. And we are spending billions on uh, omega-3 oils with massive promotions, and the data simply doesn't stack up. So again, it's, this is my general attitude towards supplements. The more we talk about them, the more we diminish understanding real food and how we can get all these nutrients from other sources, from nuts and seeds and plants uh, in other ways other than from a bottle and improve our general health. Uh, every time everyone says, oh, here's a quick cure for this, it means you're not educating someone about how else you should be getting that uh, omega-3. And I think that's really, that's really important. So massively overhyped. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'll upset lots of people who swear by it and no evidence it makes you you or your kids brainier either. So the data is out there. You're interpreting it, writing books and breaking it down in a way people can understand. But why is this not being embraced by people as a whole and by governments and, and changing the way, you know, restrictions are, are placed on, on societies and the way food is served in schools? Like, why is this not trickling to the right people and having an impact on society as a whole? I think it's the same reason that the, um, we, we were smoking cigarettes for so long without any health warnings. Uh, and we look back and say, why didn't people not do anything in the 1960s or 70s about this? So we had you know, 20 years, we knew that these things were bad for us and we weren't going to change. It's, uh, you know, I think that 10, 10 massive global food companies control um, 80% of all our food in the world, and they're bigger than countries. They're, they're lobbying all the governments in the world to make sure that nothing really changes. Uh, the food supplement companies are now nearly as big as the food companies, and they're not the small little, police, little places that people think, oh, little quaint, oh, food supplements, they're not big government, they're not big pharma, you know, they're little, little shops, little artisans make them. They're made in mega factories in China. Uh, with billion dollar budgets to promote them. So you've got this huge marketing campaign. You also got lobbyists in uh, governments everywhere making sure that uh, people eat more ultra processed food. And if, if necessary, you just add in omega threes to the food. Uh, and so you've got crap food, you add in this stuff, bit of vitamin D, bit of omega three, bit of zinc, and you know, your firemen. Uh, and that is the model that the Western world is, is going for in, uh, in a big way because of that's the commercial model. So until somebody breaks that, you're gonna, uh, people aren't going to listen just to me. They're going to um, listen to all the adverts on billboards and buses and uh, TV commercials that you know, people like me can't compete with. But hopefully there's a ground you know, up movement of people who really want to bring back real food, knowing that it's got everything we need in it. 
And do you feel like with people like you putting that message out in the world and with the internet these days where messages can spread and, and there's, you know, no censorship technically, do you feel like things are changing in a better way or are we still at ground zero with that? No, I think we are changing. And um, I've noticed, you know, in the, in the, in the last decade since I've been writing books on nutrition, definitely many more people are engaged uh, not only by my books, but I mean, more people are educated about it. There's podcasts, uh, you know, I'm being invited on more and more podcasts. There's more vehicles for me to spread the word and people like me. I'm certainly not alone. And that's, that's really important. Um, and uh, there seems to be a more general, general consensus, you know. Um, I think even five years ago, there was a lot of disparate ways. Oh, well, you know, it's all gluten. It's all this or it's all that. But I think things are converging that we've got a, a major food crisis on our hands and that um, the big evil you know is becoming is becoming clear that we need to tackle and so uh, I'm definitely more optimistic than I was uh, five years ago that this ground roots movement can actually affect change because if enough people on the ground uh, don't buy their stuff in supermarkets, the supermarkets don't care. They'll sell anything. They'll change. And so the consumer does have the power uh, and doesn't have to wait for you know governments to stop being uh, corrupt and do something. So I think consumer power can change this. You know, I've noticed in five years in, I don't know uh, what uh, Canada is like and maybe it's the US, but you can get kefir, kefir everywhere now. And... The consumer can has changed that, so suddenly fermented foods are everywhere uh, in in the UK in any supermarket, and we have the power as consumers to change what is available for us, and we can say no to ultra processed foods if we want to, but it's a big battle because only people with sufficient funds and money can do that because they are so cheap, and that's that's part of the problem. What happens when you put out a book like this, Spoon Fed, and I can assume you're not making a lot of friends because on both ends of the spectrum, you're you're going against government policies. And then on the other hand, you're you're breaking these myths that a lot of people in the health and wellness space stand behind and believe in things like supplements and fish oil and and gluten, which we can get into. But there's so many different things that you're going uphill and against the grain on. So how does that what happens when you put out a book like this? Well, you can't make an omelette without breaking some eggs. And I think that's really what I, I've learned here. That, But I, I'm at a stage of my life and my career that um, I feel I can say this. You know, I'm, uh, I've written over 900 scientific articles, so it's hard for me to criticize and say, well, he, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's not a scientist or he's not a this. You know, people try and say, well, he didn't train officially in nutrition, you know, but usually this is from some uh, nutritionist with who's done two years study and written, you know, one paper for their PhD. So it's um, I, I'm in a quite a unique position that I, I can speak without getting sacked from my university. I don't have government grants, so they can't control that. And I, I feel that there's enough people that support what I say. You know, when I wrote, you know, Diet Myth, I got so many emails and letters from saying, thank you, you've changed the way I think about food, you know, keep doing what you're doing. But the the, the odd um, negative response didn't really worry me too much because uh, I realized that, you know, I'm not, I'm not the guy who's going to be the diplomat for government, right? <laughs> They're not going to ask me to do the report. But um, I do have problems with the world of nutrition because a group of nutritionists are really in, too much embedded with the supplement world, and they often make their their livings that way, and that you know that's an unfortunate thing. That it's very hard for them to get disconnected to to that. So, of all the things I say in my book, uh, the ones that people disagree with most uh, happens to be on the supplements. So mostly they they agree with most things I say, but you know in a way. Hopefully, I'm even-handed about uh, everyone's preconceptions. But I think what I want to do is just make people think again and not believe everything they've been taught, 
you know, whether it's about meat, about fish, about veganism, about uh, supplements. And I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm in a lucky place. I can sort of speak my mind. And I've had relatively little flack compared to, I think, what I would have got 20 years ago. Um, and that's partly because of my uh, academic standing, you know, as a full professor and medic and whatever. Quite hard to, you know, really bring me down. Uh, I, I, maybe that's it. Maybe I've just been lucky. And to caveat the supplement piece, there are all different categories of supplements too. I'm not sure how you feel about it, but there are smaller companies that are making good supplements that are food based and of high integrity. You mentioned the ones over in China. There's probably a ton more of the lower quality ones. But I'm curious, when it comes to something you know is being made, you know, in the UK or the US, and it's a smaller company and it's it's made from real food, are you open to including any of those or different green powders that have high nutrient profiles that can supplement a healthy diet? Is there any gray area there for you or are you not into it? No, I think, I, look, I mean, I, I say in my books, I, I've made mistakes and uh, realized and, and changed my mind and moved on in, in many ways. So absolutely open to any, anything new science. And I think the one area, I mean, I, we talked about probiotics and, you know, I'm not particularly keen on the ones at the moment, but I see the next generation as being very exciting in a way they're supplements. Um, I also see the, the world of prebiotics. We, you sort of touched on it when you're talking about taking real foods and, uh, you know, sort of mashing them up. And, but if you, if you took, say, you know, 100 plants and you freeze dried them and made them very edible and you put them into a, a powder and you could tell me that those nutrients are the same and you added that to, uh, as a way of kick-starting your, your gut microbes, then I'd say that that would be a, a very acceptable way. But I, I want to move away from this reductionism. You know, the idea that, you know, we've got 20, at least 27,000 chemicals in food. And how many are there? 20, there are 20 common supplements. So we've picked 20 of the ones that, you know, we've known about for the last 100 years or so. And we say, okay, let's focus on those. Forget all the other guys. And that's, that's what I don't like is this idea that we've got, you know, that's why zinc is still used. Uh, and it still has in most countries, you're allowed to say it helps the immune system. And those studies are complete rubbish. Um, and why focus on zinc when, You've got, you know, in, in most fruits or, you know, hundreds of other useful chemicals. So let's go to the whole plant, find ways of delivering the whole plant to people, uh, whether you call it prebiotics or you call it, you know, um, veggie mixes or whatever. Yes, very happy there. But let's, let's not pretend we understand the science and therefore we make up this pseudoscience to back up to one single ingredient. The combinations of them, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I'm going to have an open mind on those ones. And we now have the ability to actually test it. You know, I think that's one thing I'm going to be uh, doing in the next few years is is actually doing some uh, community testing. So we've got, um, as I said, 30,000 people have done the Zoe Personal Nutrition Study. Uh, we can get them to uh, take some of these supplements and retest their gut microbes. We've got half a million people on uh, the Zoe Health Study, which was based around COVID, and we're hoping to do big dietary interventions on them to to, to see how they feel. You get fifty thousand people to take, you know, omega three, and uh, fifty thousand take some other dummy for for a month and see how they feel. We can actually do this, but also moving towards this this uh, new goal. So I I'll always keep an open mind, but I want us not to be reductionist. And I think we have to realize how little we know. And if we ignore all those chemicals in, in whole foods, we're really dumbing it all down. One more controversial topic I want to hit on before we part ways, and that's gluten. Because this seems to be, if anything, picking up more steam in the health and wellness space. More and more people are adopting a gluten-free diet, saying that they're sensitive to gluten. What is the science saying? Well, the science says that 1% of people are definitely have a gluten problem. They're, they have celiac disease and they're, they're tests for them. The problem is the other 9% of the population that think they have a gluten problem, when it turns out, when you actually test them with gluten, uh, most of them don't. 
So what I think people re- need to, need to realise is that um, self testing is really quite difficult unless you're going to get someone to uh, f- you know fool you and double blind you and give you gluten free pasta one day and and not the other and you know do this in a really systematic way. People are fooled by it. And once you feel you've, you've got a gluten problem, in a way you have it. And a lot of it, I think, is, is due to eating really bad f- breads, uh, chemical breads that are not made uh, the uh, traditional way with sourdough, but are made chemically that might cause bloating through the other, other parts of that process, not just the gluten. And often eating sandwiches that are very uh, bad for you because of other things in it. Generally, it's 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 a sign that you're you have a a poor gut microbiome and you're eating generally poor foods. Uh, I think it's what when you speak to a lot of nutritionists who deal with it with um, people with these problems clinically. Um, so I think people need to reassess uh, this obsession with gluten because the alternatives tend to be less healthy than uh, eating gluten itself because you you end, end up with more ultra processed replacements which the food industry loves. So again, you're falling into the trap of eating, paying three times more for your food. Uh, I'd say, go to these people, go back, look at your whole diet, you know, consult a nutritionist properly, uh, and try, if you are going to go back to bread, make sure you know you, you get something that's homemade, uh, sourdough, long fermented, and uh, the vast majority of people will not have problems. All right, Tim, I am one of those people currently avoiding gluten, but I'm totally open to experimenting and and my ways of seeing and and ways of being changing over time. So I'll have to keep an open mind. And I want to thank you for coming on the show. I'm going to link up your book, link up your social media, link up your website. And I just want to thank you for coming on the show, breaking all kinds of myths and just sharing so much great information. So thank you. It's been a pleasure. And can I just tell the listeners also that uh, if they want to look into their gut microbes and they want to uh, learn about personalized nutrition, uh, in the US and the UK, they can uh, get the Zoe kit that we helped uh, develop over the last five years just by going to joinzoe.com and uh, can join the 30,000 or so more people that have already done this and are helping us with our research. All right, we'll put that in the show notes too. Thank you, Tim. Thanks. Bye. Now that you're done my episode with Tim, be sure and check out my conversation with Dr. William Davis right here. We get into how to build your super gut. So these are people, Jesse, who are accomplishing normalization, reversal of SIBO without any antibiotic, no prescription, no herbal antibiotic, just with the yogurt. 